Thank you. I want to start by addressing a warm thanks to Professor Letitia, Head of School of Education, to our Dean, Julie Mackey, and of course to my host, Una Cunningham, who made me come here. And uh, I'm really happy to meet all of you, and uh, so far I've met especially Una's PhD students, and it's really, I'm really impressed by your work. My lecture today is a presentation and a problematization of, uh, on how Sweden organized uh, reception for newly arrived students, children and adole adolescents. And uh, this presentation builds on a project I conducted together with three other colleagues uh, at the beginning of this decade. And I try to think about Sweden's situation in receiving migrants over the years. And I think uh, I dare say that up until 1990, the migrants coming to Sweden, they came for work or family reunion. But from 1990 and 1991 and until today, uh, starting with the wars in Yugoslavia, we have mainly received refugees. And that is, of course, the case today because of the war in Syria, um, Iraq, and so on. And uh, this influx of a lot of migrants, refugees, have affected our schools in several ways. And that is what I want to present to you today. And also, I, I want to show the positive sides, but I also want to show the sites where we definitely still have problems to solve. I want to say a little about the situation in Sweden today. And uh, during the school year of 2014 and 15, we have our school year over the new year. Uh, we had in compulsory school 24% of the students having another uh, mother tongue than Swedish and being Swedish as a second language learners. In upper secondary, we even had a little more, 25%. And these figures have been rather stable since 2015. Uh, in 2015, uh, we uh, took in about 163,000 asylum seekers, mainly from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Eritrea, Somalia, and Iran, and stress, of course, from uh, Syria. Among these 163,000, there were 52,000 uh, children between 7 and 17 years, 29,000 young adults uh, between 18 and 24, and a lot of them were boys. And um, at a dinner, dinner party, no, it was a lunch uh, meeting lately, we, we were only women at that lunch, and we started to ask, well, wh what countries have a majority of men in uh, their countries. And it turned out that Sweden was one of the top countries for having more men than women. Earlier there was a balance, but this later influx changed this situation slightly. And what, uh, what we got was a lot of unaccompanied minors, especially from uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. And our feeling and their feeling is that they have a right to education. And we don't make a difference between refugees, migrants, family reunion, 
we give the same education rights to all of them. Uh, the latest situation have changed a little of the school regulations in Sweden and we now have a definition of newly arrived students between 7 and 18 years. It is a person who has migrated to Sweden regardless of reason, refugee, family reunion or parent labour migration. It is a person a young person who does not possess knowledge of Swedish and there is also a new uh, rule that a student is only considered a newly arrived up to four years after uh, enrolling in a school in Sweden. Before we didn't have that uh, figure, we, we never stopped calling them newly arrived. So I think this is really good that uh, this change came about. Uh, we have several organizational <coughs> responses for receiving the migrant students and uh, for students at elementary level, compulsory school between 7 and 15, grades 1 to 9, the most common uh, organization is in introductory classes and that has been the most common uh, model for all the years we have received uh, migrants. Uh, during the latest, um, let me say, 10 years there has been some criticism of introductory classes. One has had the feeling that uh, students were staying too long in the introductory classes. And there has been a lot of talk about integration versus segregation. And there is a fear in Sweden of segregation, naturally. Uh, but this made some uh, municipalities a bit afraid and uh, they also got uh, criticism from our national school inspectorate and they changed some municipalities overnight from introductory classes as an organization form to immediate mainstream uh, classes and I will focus very much on these two reception forms today and try to show the positive and the less positive factors with these models. Uh, there are also some other mu municipalities who gather all newcomers in a municipality in one or two schools. We also have municipalities who have some kind of first reception, sometimes called a landing, and then they uh, transfer the migrant, the newly arrived students to introductory classes and then to mainstra mainstream classes. Uh, one municipality in Sweden, that is Malmö, our third biggest city, has created a special school for the older uh, new arrival students, that is those uh, in grade 7, 8 and 9. Uh, and then we have all kinds of combinations uh, over Sweden uh, as two models, but the two most important and mostly used are the first two ones. In upper secondary we only have one model for receiving uh, migrants and it is called language introduction, språk introduction, and um, it's a program where you focus on Swedish as a second language and some of the subjects and each individual school can decide what subjects they want to focus on. 
a little bit about Swedish school regulation because the influx of um, migrants made the Ministry of Education change some of the regulations. Uh, all of a sudden, we uh, acknowledge the backpack migrants are coming with. That is, it is now mandatory for each school to make a mapping of uh, every student's earlier schooling and knowledge. And that has to be done very quickly, within two months after arrival in the school. One also has to enroll every student in a mainstream class. Even if they go to introductory class, they have to belong to a mainstream class. And with this mainstream class, it is usually the case that they go to practical and aesthetic <coughs> subjects together with their mainstream peers. Introductory class uh, was a model and an etiquette which didn't appear in the law earlier, and now it does, uh, which is uh, very new and um, positive, I think. Uh, there is, um, uh, though in introductory class you can only stay for at most two years and uh, only partly, that is, those practical aesthetic subjects you should go together with your uh, mainstream class. You could also have a prioritized schedule, that is, you could take away a couple of subjects and give priorities to Swedish as a second language. And the fact, of course, is that when students get out to the mainstream class, they are all instructed through Swedish. Uh, it is also a rule now that uh, these new arrival students should have the same instruction hours as all other students. This has not always been the case. Uh, I want to show you and talk a little about the resources that we afford the newly arrived students, and I will start with the green. I can, <coughs> can I point? Yeah. I will start with the green ovals. Uh, we have mother tongue instruction in Sweden, and we, uh, we give mother tongue instruction for about 40 minutes a week. Some of the newly arrived students might, in some municipality, get more, up to 80 minutes, but 40 is the regular one. And at present we have about, it differs from year to year, but about 140 different languages which you can get mother tongue instruction in. Uh, we have, and uh, mother tongue instruction is a subject which is self-elected uh, by the students. So you, as a migrant, second language student, have to choose this subject. And of all the students who are entitled to have mother tongue instruction, which is everyone who has the mother tongue as a live, um, a living, language at home, about today 56% elect to go to mother tongue in instruction. We also have something uh, which I translated as subject support through L1. That is, when you start getting into contact with the various subjects in the Swedish curriculum, you can also get support in your, through your first language. 
So these mother tongue teachers can work both as in mother tongue instruction and in subject support. But as you see, I've also written L2 and English here. Uh, the subject support is verbally and in speech in the L1, but the students come with their Swedish books. So after a while, when students are getting a higher proficiency in Swedish, this subject support is very much bilingual. And for the students coming with English, and during my project, we noticed that a number of the students coming from Africa came <coughs> with English. They could also have subject support in English. Uh, we had, for example, among our focus students, a uh, young uh, girl, uh, Nora, from Cairo. She was a Copt and came as a refugee to Sweden with her family. And she had studied natural science and mathematics in English in Cairo. And when she came to uh, a large school in Sweden, she could directly go into the mathematics subject because the teacher could support her, the subject teacher could support her through English. Very soon, immediately, of course, instruction in Swedish as a second language starts. It starts with uh, a basic everyday language instruction. And very soon, the teachers in Swedish as a second language take in a couple of uh, school subjects and they instruct via these uh, school subjects. The most important resource is, of course, the student him or herself. We have noticed in the project a great difference between depending on whether you come with a full school background or with no school background. Um, we have in the project uh, students coming with uh, zero school years and we have students coming with all their school years. I will say something more about that later. Uh, students, school background, literacy level, subject knowledge has a great importance for their success in the new country. And that is also something that, for example, the American uh, researchers, Thomas and Collier, uh, stated in their 1997-2002 studies as one of the most important factors for school success. Very important resources, especially for the everyday uh, language development, are uh, peers. Either peers in the school with Swedish as the first language, or more established multilingual, bilingual students. And, of course, subject instruction in mainstream class. Here, I just noted, uh, due to the great influx uh, of all these uh, migrants that came to Sweden, uh, the Ministry of Education gave a lot of assignments to the, now I have to say it right, Swedish National Agency of Education, and the agency, of course, gave those uh, assignments to the universities in Sweden. So one, <laughs> one university has uh, uh, created uh, this uh, instructions for mapping materials to map the students' school background. Uh, one um, university <coughs> Uh, has uh, done an assessment tool for Swedish as a second language 
And I know that one of the members of the group doing this work has been here in New Zealand looking at the assessment tools you have for language development. And uh, the National Agency has also spent a lot of money on in-service training for all teachers because, as I will come to soon, there is a wish to get the new arrival students out into the regular classes as soon as possible. And that means that uh, the regular teachers in all the various subjects, they won't have students with a full, with a high proficiency in Swedish. So they also have to adapt their way of instruction. And it has been stressed, and I think it's a very good idea, that when teachers from a school get into these in-service uh, training courses, they should go there as a team, so you don't come back from a course uh, being the only one having the new knowledge. So the focus I and especially our PhD candidate had uh, in the project is the language development of these new arrivals. And we focused on the 14 to 15 year olds, those uh, going into grade eight and nine, because that is the def absolutely most difficult time to change country. It's easy for the children, it's easy for the receiving countries to take the small children, but these ones are the hard cases. Language development, academic development has been a focus and social inclusion. And for those of you reading Swedish, this is the book we managed to present um, um, to the field. Um, it is a problem uh, as a Swedish researcher in this field that uh, the field Swedish as a second language is rather new and we have to cater for both the field, all the teachers, but also publish and cater for the research field and that we should do in English, of course. Uh, a question which is uh, important to discuss when you talk about the reception of newly arrived students is how should we interpret, it, interpret equality? And here I'm leaning on the nowadays professor in special education, Mara Westling Aloudi, but this was her from her dissertation in 2002. And she is um, discussing two perspectives of equality. First, she talks about equality as same instruction. That is a wish from society, authorities, uh, school institutes to uh, create, from a top-down perspective, keep or create a homogeneous uh, society. And on the other hand, she talks about equality as same opportunities, which she considers more of a bottom-up perspective, where you start from the student's needs and you all the time have a full understanding of the needs and the qualifications of each individual student and what they uh, need. And uh, she also talks about the right to be treated equal even if being different. In my project and in uh, Sweden as a whole, I think we have, we have still a very lively discussion between, on one say, side, sociologists, 
who are very much concerned about social inclusion and on the other side linguists, language education, educators who are mainly, of course we are keen on social inclusion also, but priority we give language education and uh, the question is uh, what comes first. This is the project, Newly Arrived Children and Learning, a cross-disciplinary study of the learning conditions for newly arrived children in Swedish schools. It was funded by the Swedish Research Council in 2011 to 14. Uh, four researchers, Nihad Bunar, sociologist, me, language education, Jenny Nilsson Folke, our PhD student, PhD student, and she focused on the students, their experiences of coming as a new student during the first one and a half years of their stay in Sweden and at school. And Fredrik Hatzberg from education focusing on student, cou student counselling these students. Sweden has 290 municipalities of different sizes and we knew that we couldn't get into all of them so we decided to choose three municipalities of different sizes, a small, a medium and a large municipality. And uh, we went into four schools in these municipalities and it so happened that they all had the organization model introductory classes, which made us a bit disappointed, I admit. Research doesn't go the way you want all the time. I've catered for that. Uh, <laughs> in the schools, we visited four schools, but I will uh, talk mainly about three of them. In the small municipality, the school we went into, they had about 3% multilingual or bilingual students in the whole school. And those were the students in the introductory class, which we visited mostly. In the medium school, they had 70% uh, multilingual students. And in the large municipality school, they had 100% uh, multilingual students. And when we analyzed the results, of course, the greatest differences and the most interesting comparisons we make between the small municipality and the large municipality. <coughs> the theory and the method we are using are from second language learning, multilingualism, school and classroom ethnography. <coughs> And we did audio recordings, field notes, uh, photos. We took photographs of practically everything the teacher wrote on the whiteboard, almost everything the students wrote in their books. We had interviews with teachers, students, principals, student counselors. And the research questions uh, Jenny Nilsson Folke and I worked from was mainly these. What resources are available in the reception of newly arrived students? How are language and ad academic development supported? How is student social inclusion supported? And what are students' experiences of the conditions for learning and participation in introductory classes and in the transition to mainstream classes. Some of the results uh, from introductory classes, they are rather small. They are uh, comprised of 10 to 12 students. They have their own classroom and we noticed that the location for this classroom in the school had a great importance 
on inclusion as a whole. Uh, in the small uh, municipality school and the large municipality school, the introductory classes were in the middle or beside the other classrooms. In the middle, uh, medium-sized uh, municipality schools, they were on the other side of the schoolyard, which meant that they did not have the same breaks as the, other, the rest of the school. So both students, newly arrived students, and their teachers didn't meet the other categories uh, if they didn't make an appointment to meet them. Uh, they all had, uh, were the introductory classes were run by uh, teachers in Swedish as a second language, but additionally there were teachers in mother tongue and subject support. They got uh, sports, music, arts, crafts and home economics in their mainstream class. And that functioned rather well, except for sports. Uh, in our book we write that, be a bit careful with sports. It's quite an unprotected uh, subject from the perspective of the students at the beginning and at the end of the um, instruction hour. You have to undress, you have to take a shower and, well, unprotected. Take care there. <coughs> Municipality size had a great importance and that was also due to the experience uh, the schools had had with newly arrived students and migrants. The small municipality school had never had an introductory class before, so both uh, students uh, and teachers were new to this phenomenon. Uh, the municipality had earlier had um, used immediate mainstreaming. They had not received very many uh, migrants at all in this small municipality. And now when they all of a sudden got seven migrants, they decided to start an introductory class. And they also decided to place this introductory class in the most Swedish school, that is, 3% of the students, I said before, were bilingual. All of the others had Swedish as their first language. And uh, both students and teachers weren't very interested in these new migrants. You would think, and I think we, we have said earlier in Sweden that, of course, the best thing for migrants is to put them in a school with lots of Swedish-speaking students, but it was very difficult to become friends with the Swedish-speaking students. And the teachers, they wanted uh, in their classes students with top proficiency in Swedish, and when the students didn't have that, they couldn't understand why, and they didn't want the students to speak in Arabic or whatever together. So the easiest way to get friends was in the large municipality school where there were already 100% multilingual students. There the teachers said, well, in a month they have a friend and it doesn't have to be in the uh, introductory class, it can be in any of the other classes. Uh, Swedish as a second language teachers were educated between one and three semesters in, um, uh, at the university. The time uh, students spent in the introductory class was about one and a half years, three semesters, or do you say terms here? Terms? Okay. Uh, 
As for teacher collaboration in mainstream, uh, we have seen one example, and that means that there was not very much uh, collaboration between Swedish as a second language teachers in mainstream uh, contexts and other subject teachers, but one exception. In the large uh, school, uh, there were three teachers in social science who had the same, they worked with the same theme all the time, and when we, we visited them, they worked on the Second World War. Uh, they collaborated with a teacher in Swedish as a second language, and she had special instruction occasions for the students who had recently moved over to mainstream and also invited other students who wanted to join. And she analyzed and discussed, explained the texts in the history books for uh, during these specific hours. And these hours, she was a brilliant teacher, but, uh, and that was important, I think. Uh, and the, the students said that this, uh, this makes all the difference for us, because now we can go back to our mainstream class and we can understand the films, the teachers talk, and we can even understand the books a little bit better, and we passed the tests that the history teacher gives us. Uh, support post after introductory classes. Uh, there was also a big difference in the small uh, municipality class. It was the Swedish as a second language teacher in the introductory class who gave that support. In the medium uh, municipality schools, uh, once you were out of the introductory class, you were out and you had no connection whatsoever to the introductory class. As for joint responsibility, we saw a lot of that in the large municipality school because they had the experience. They had worked with multilingual students for 20 years. Uh, I'll say a little, very little, <laughs> about uh, Jenny Nilsson's um, part of the work. Actually, tomorrow she is uh, defending her thesis in Stockholm. We had 22 students in our group who were in grades 8 and 9, and Jenny interviewed all of them during three semesters. They came from Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Thailand, Egypt, Uganda, Algeria, Somalia, Gambia, Peru, and Russia. And this is very consistent with the situation in Sweden. We, we are not like the US having a lot of Spaniards. Uh, we have so many um, origins. From zero to full school background, we had <coughs> two students from Iraq within this group who had eight years of school background from Iraq, and they uh, walked through the uh, introductory classes in six months. Uh, we also had a young girl from Afghanistan who had not uh, received any schooling at all. And of course, it took much longer for her. So on average, the students stayed three semesters in introductory classes. So long residence as I said was a fear in some municipality is not what we saw during this project. Jenny has caught the voices of the students, which is rather unusual in the research we have done so far. 
Uh, the students say about introductory <laughs> classes that the introductory classes provides a sense of inclusion both pedagogically and socially. It is a place to rest. And we could see that when they moved over to mainstream that they were very happy to come back to the localities of the in, I, introductory class. They came and sat in the sofa there or in front of the computer. The negative sense, because they also give that voice of the introductory class, is the sense of difference. They very much want to become like everyone else. And it is Jenny's feeling that this feeling of being different is something which transfers with them also when they uh, are transferring into mainstream classes. And then when they come to mainstream classes, uh, which they have longed so much for, they notice that it's rather difficult and at some moments rather disappointing uh, because they might not get subject support in one of the schools. They didn't even get Swedish as a language, uh, second language instruction anymore. So there is, in some cases, a lack of provision and social and pedagogical resources. Uh, there is also, is the feeling of Jenny, a school hierarchy which uh, these students meet in the schools and a norm is sometimes developing which make these uh, students possible to exclude. I talked about uh, the context matters, but uh, the context, um, but uh, with Jenny's words, in the small school, uh, individuals, the newly arrived, are rather isolated, difficult to find friends. In the middle school, it's the organization which is a bit isolated from the rest of the school. And in the large municipality school, the school with 100% multilingual students, this school is rather isolated when it concern, if you look at the whole city. And the students are very aware of that we don't have any Swedish speaking students, that is, L1 speaking, uh, Swedish speaking students in our school. And they felt <coughs> that that was a bit awkward. So my uh, interpretation of the introductory classes is that they don't use all the resources. That is, they don't get to the peers, the, the peers in the school, and they don't get to the subject instruction in the mainstream classes. We were disappointed that we didn't have a municipality with immediate mainstream uh, placement. I tried to, um, to do something about that, so I worked, uh, I supervised uh, a master thesis, uh, and uh, Jenny Udling, I think I'll go directly there. Uh, she covered another municipality who changed from introductory classes to uh, immediate mainstreaming and uh, what this municipality did was that they did very early on before the rule the mandatory rule came they did a mapping of the students school background and they also gave the newly arrivals an introductory course for three weeks about uh, um, ordinary Swedish uh, school schedule and some basic Swedish phrases. But after that, 
the students went into a regular mainstream class, but for the first five weeks, they were followed or shadowed uh, by a mother tongue or subject support teacher uh, with the same L1 as these students had. So for the first five weeks, they could understand everything that was said in these classes. After that, they were on their own. Uh, it was also decided that the subject teacher's plan for every theme in every subject should be sent to the subject support teacher during these five weeks so they could uh, plan and uh, know what to talk about. Uh, what was a pity and very strange in this municipality was that they missed out Swedish as a second language. And they said, uh, the municipality said to the principals, this is your business, you have to do something about Swedish as a second language. Uh, we don't bother with that in our municipality. And in the special school that Jenny, um, this is another Jenny, they are almost the same age and they all are named Jenny in that <laughs> generation. <laughs> um, the principal in this specific school, she said to the subject teachers in history, physics and so on, uh, I think you could develop these newly arrived students uh, basic Swedish. And the uh, subject teachers looked at her and said, <laughs> well, well, we aren't language teachers, we are history, <laughs> physics teachers. So in the end, she had to uh, engage a teacher in Swedish as a second language. Uh, when Jenny met the students who came into this uh, specific mainstream class and school, uh, she found them at the back of the classroom and they, when interviewing them, they said that uh, they had also been given laptops by uh, the municipality and they were very much engaged in the laptops and they didn't have much contact with either subject teachers or peers. So they felt rather isolated in their class. I think I have to uh, skip the next study. I'll just say to you, so. Uh, I'll show that I have a little more uh, material. A colleague of mine at language, uh, language Education Department sent out a questionnaire to two other municipalities that had also made this change from introductory and uh, to mainst immediate mainstream. And from these th uh, three municipalities, my conclusion is this, that the most, the, the strongest reason, as I understand the voices from the field in Sweden, is that immediate mainstream placement want to take care of segregation. That is, they want, they believe that immediate mainstream placement uh, will include the students in the mainstream. And my um, analysis says that they don't manage that. They give in these three municipalities mother tongue instruction, subject support. It turned out that they gave very little of Swedish as a second language. And they don't manage to integrate the newly arrivals with the peers and with subject instruction. The students said that they didn't feel that the subject teachers in mainstream was a resource for them and not also the students. This is in Swedish. It is only um, Kerstin and Una who can read it. And I don't want you to read it. I just want you to look at the circles, the circles I did. My 
conclusion is that with our two organizational models, we don't, we don't come all the way. So uh, I say that we need a synthesis of both models. Uh, we need students to be enrolled in mainstream, but at the same time get instruction in Swedish as a second language and get support, subject support, as long as they need. And we know from the four international studies that we have in the world that to get even, to get at the proficiency in academic subjects as your L1 peers, that takes at best four years, but sometimes up to eight years, up to ten years. We need a higher flexibility. We need to look at the individuals much more. Uh, we saw some flexible groups uh, within uh, our project. Not very much of support in class. Some we saw support outside class. We had these introductory classes and we saw some grouping according to proficiency in English and mathematics. But I'm sad to say that some of the groupings uh, for English was given through Swedish, which is of course impossible for newly arrivals who don't have English. I couldn't find examples of this synthesis in Sweden, so I went abroad and I uh, got stuck in Canada and looked at a model they created in Alberta. You are very welcome to go to the website there. They divided the reception into five levels and they try to make this synthesis, which I think Sweden would need as well. In the first level, they give the new arrivals 50% to 75% time in introductory classes. Main subjects, they keep them, but in modified form and with a selected content. And the rest of the time, students are in mainstream, but they are supported in mainstream. There is a focus on explicit instruction of basic language uh, and concepts. I'll rush to... I'm happy to give anyone this PowerPoint afterwards. Uh, let's run to level four. Uh, at this time, the situation is flipped. The main time is uh, the new arrivals are staying in the mainstream class, but they are still supported. Main subject and choices the students have made and subjects results are on grade level, but with support. The rest of the time they can still be in uh, specific language instruction groups and have small group instruction also within the class context and so on. So what we need in Sweden is teacher collaboration. We have to get more teacher collaboration between teachers in Swedish as a second language, mother tongue, subject support and teachers in all the other subjects. And that is what I'm now more interested in, disciplinary literacy we have to work a lot with. And that is uh, as suggested by um, Elisabeth Moye, for example, 2007, a social just education. She is not talking uh, exclusively about multilingual students, she is talking about everyone. And for this, teachers need time 
Our teachers don't have that time because they are very much occupied with the um, uh, documenting results, assessment, and so on. That has gone uh, over, over the limit in Sweden. <laughs> we need flexibility according to students' background. Some of the students went through introductory classes in six months. Others will need more than one and a half year, probably. We need explicit language scaffolding, not only telling the students what to do, but also how to do, give much more uh, language models on how to do uh, uh, their tasks. We have to educate them in meta-language to be able to talk about what happens in texts and so on. Uh, we have to focus and have activities on language and content, and there I had disciplinary literacy. And we have to provide rich interaction in language and subject instruction. We have to um, give tasks where students speak, read and write in all subjects, not only in language arts. And we have to make students active producers. So that is my last word. And I'm sorry I rushed in the end, and you have been very patient. And if you want to ask me some questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. <laughs>